there was a pastor who was preparing a message for sex to his congregation, and he decided he wanted to play a joke on his wife. So he told her that week's message would actually be about horseback riding instead. Well, the wife was kind of shocked, and she said, you can't, you got to be kidding me, you can't do that. But the pastor insisted, so his wife said, well, if you're going to preach on horseback riding, I'm not coming on Sunday, because you're going to embarrass yourself and me. Well, the pastor thought this was kind of funny, so he continued the ruse all the way till Sunday, and his wife, true to her word, did not show up. Well, the next day, the pastor's wife was out and about and ran into one of the congregation members who ran up to her and shared about how impactful the sermon was and how sorry the wife couldn't attend. The wife was a little shocked, and she said, well, it couldn't have been that impactful. He's only done it twice. The member paused and said, oh, really? And the wife said, yeah, once before we were married and once after we got married. Confused and intrigued, this member asked, is that true? And annoyed, the wife said, yeah. And just between you and I, the fact is, he fell off both times. <laughs> I just like to establish the fact, if you're watching online and still watching, thank you for continuing to watch. My wife is in the room today. I'm just going to add that, okay, so she knows what the message is about. And we're talking about sex. We've been talking about that the last two weeks. And if you're a guest, again, we're glad that you're here because it's a topic that I think our culture talks about way too much. And I think it's time that as God's church, we stand up and say, listen, God's word has a lot to say about sex. And we want to learn what God's word has to say about that. Because I think it's truth. and It is truth in life and life giving as well. And just to set this up for you, I mentioned this last week. I said this series is going to be a little bit different. Um, instead of having one certain passage or passage going through, this series is actually one continual conversation that we're having. So week one was kind of the launch of it. If you missed it, please go back and watch it. Go to our website, yankton.church. Go to our uh, podcast, listen to it, um, because it is going to be an ongoing conversation. And I mentioned this last week, I might offend you, I might put you on a defense, and if that happens, I'm probably doing my job, um, but, but I'm going to encourage you to stay with it. Stay with it till the end. Stay with it through these conversations because I think it's very important. And just to set this up again, we talked about this last week. The title of our series, Let's Talk About Sex, comes from the 1990 hit Salt and Pepper. I feel old every time I say that. 1990, they came out with a hit song called Let's Talk About Sex. And they did it to get attention and let us just say it got a lot of attention. They did it so the kids would be interested and the parents would be mad, which, as we talked about, whenever the parents get upset about something, that's just free advertising for all the kids who want to do it. And I, growing up in that era, I remember it. But why am I talking about that in church is because I think the words of this song are very truthful. And there's a lot of impact in that. And so I'm just going to remind you of this lyrics as we're going through this to kind of set this up in case you haven't heard it. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good and all the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. And then here's the, core, or the verse. To the people at home or in the crowd, it keeps coming up anyhow. Don't be coy, avoid, or make void the topic. And don't miss this part, church, because that ain't going to stop it. Now we talk about sex on the radio and the video shows. Many knows anything goes. And this line right here is the reason why we sampled this for our series title. Let's tell how it is, how it could be how it was, and of course, how it should be. Church, let's continue our talk on sex. And last week, we set this up, and I think this is so key. And if you got your note sheets, you're going to want to write this down again. On the back of this is blank. That's where you write that stuff. There's a question that is key to this series. And you probably hear me say this every week. We have to ask, what is my authority in life? Every single man, woman, and child have an authority by which they live by. And church, I want to ask you, what is that in your life? Because for me, it's God's word. And if I say God's word is my authority, then how I live out my life should reflect what God's word actually says. And God's word has a lot to say about how we live our life, particularly in the area of sex. And last week, just to kind of recap, or if you weren't here and missed it, there was three approaches that people take to sex. The first one is they try to eliminate it. We're just not going to talk about it. We're going to avoid it. We're not going to go there. We're just going to try to eliminate it. And that doesn't work so good, does it? And then there's the other approach where we just try to engage in it. And if it feels good, do it. And whatever you feel like, go and, and make it happen. But that causes hurt and pain too, doesn't it? But the third approach is what we've decided that God's word says. We're not going to eliminate it. We're not going to engage in it. We're going to elevate it. We're going to take it to the level that God always intended sex to be at. 
And we talked about how sex is not just a physical experience. It's not just physical. There's so much more that has to go about that. So to continue the conversation today, I want you to open your Bibles way back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. It should be the first part of your Bible, and it's the first thing that happened in all creation. So we're going to go back to the beginning. Something very interesting about Genesis chapter 1, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, again, this is a plug for that class. You should come and be part of it. One of the things you'll learn about Genesis chapter 1 is it is, in a sense, a, an act of poetry. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. What I'm saying it is it's very set up. It's very intentional how it goes. Here's what I mean by that. Each one of the days, there's the six days of creation. In every one of the six days, something interesting happens. God creates everything in pairs. Did you know that? Let me just walk you through this real quick. Day one, he created light. He created dark. Day two, he created earth. He created sky. Day three, he created water and land. Day four, he created night and day Day five, he created the fish and the birds. And day six, he created animals on the land and you and I, human beings. And when he created them, specifically human beings, something very special happened. Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to be in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, there's that phrase in there, the image of God, and it's actually repeated twice. Anytime something is in the scripture twice in a row, God means it's pretty important. But that's actually a phrase in Hebrew that I won't try to pronounce for you, but it's, it's very important to understand this concept of the image of God. God created male and female in his own image. Now, the obvious question you might be asking there is, okay, so is God a man or is God a woman? Now, we know that God is referred to as our Heavenly Father. We know that when Jesus came on earth, in physical earth, he was actually male. We know that Jesus was male. But the actual deity of God the Father is that male or female. And what Scripture tells us is it's both. God is both male and female. And he created male and female in his own image. Now, if I say that in culture today, it causes a lot of controversy, doesn't it? And again, I'm not here to argue with you. Don't get on the defense. Don't leave. Don't tune out. What I mean is, what's your authority? Is God's word your authority? God created them male and female. And then God did something kind of cool. God gave man and women and animals and plants too as well this amazing gift that we call sex. And and what you might not know about God's word is from the beginning... God explained to us about sex and what sex would be like. So on your note sheets, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three functions of sex. These are not only biblical. These are going to seem so obvious you're going to be like, yeah, right, pastor, at least the first two. So there are three basic functions of sex. Here's the first one. Again, this isn't like a newsflash. The first function of sex is for reproduction. Okay. If you're in the room today and you thought it was the stork that brought the little baby, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. (laughs) There is one way to make a baby, and that is through sex. It's one of the basic purposes of sex. And it's not just humans. Again, I mentioned before, animals, even insects, invertebrates, even in plants, they have the stamen and the pistil. You know, mammals, we have sperm and ovary. We have biscuit in the basket. Okay, I'm not going to go any further. You don't need to let your imagination go. There is a basic function of sex that is to for reproduction. Now, God created male and female in his own image, verse 27. Look at what happens in the very next verse, verse 28. After God created mankind in his own image, male and female, this is what God says. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Did you know that sex is a command from God? Okay, that's one command that we've gotten pretty good at, okay? (laughs) I'm just telling you, that's something that we, and and sex, this is important you understand. Sex was given before sin. This is still in perfection and creation that God created a place in perfection and unity and harmony. All of creation, all of mankind was one with God, and God gave into that perfection the wonderful gift of sex. So that is one of the basic functions of sex, but that's not the only function of sex. And this is the second function of sex. God gave us sex for reproduction. He also gave it to us for pleasure. Sex isn't simply a means for reproduction. It can actually be a great source of pleasure. Now, everybody look right here for a second. If God hadn't made sex so fun, 
we probably would have less kids. Can we just be honest on that, okay? That's a reason why God made sex fun. You know, there was a story. This is a true story. There was a youth pastor who was brand new at a church. And some of the parents were having trouble because a lot of the youth kids were, were engaging in sex. And the, the parents came to this youth pastor and they said, listen, you need to tell our kids that sex is bad. And the pastor looked at him and said, I can't do that. Well, they got kind of mad at him. Like, why aren't you going to do that? He goes, because I'd be lying. <laughs> sex, is, sex is great. Sex is awesome. But there's a problem with that, isn't it, right? What's the real heart of what's going on there? See, sex is not simply meant for reproduction, but there's also pleasure to that as well. God created sex for pleasure. Church, that's not wrong. That's a good feeling. God gave us a good gift. But there's a reason why God had gave us sex for reproduction and God gave us sex for pleasure. Now, this is going to be just for the guys in the audience. I want to be careful about this. One of the things about this series that I forgot to mention, I'm going to mention it here because it's important that you understand this. Um, throughout this series, we're going to have a couple guests that are going to come. And in two weeks, we're going to have a very special guest that's going to be here. You're not going to want to miss it in two Sundays. Her name is Trisha Cook. She's a good friend of mine. She's also, her and her husband are in T, South Dakota right now, and they're starting a Celebrate community there in T. So she's actually going to be here, and she's going to give the message. And I'm excited about that. You guys are going to be blessed to, to hear from Trisha. Well, why am I telling you about that is because as a guy, okay, for me to sit here and preach about sex is pretty arrogant, isn't it? Because there's kind of a whole other dimension for females of that. And I've talked to Trisha about this, and I want her to kind of walk through and explain that to her. But why am I telling you that now? Because here's what I'm going to say. We talk about sex not just being simply for reproduction. Sex is also given for pleasure. So this is for the guys in the room. Okay, So my sisters in the room, just bear with us for a second because men are kind of stupid. Okay, Here's how this works. Johns Hopkins Medical has explained to us that a woman has a 28-day cycle. It can be 21 to 35 days, and ovulation occurs 12 to 14 days before the new cycle, with the fertility window being five days leading up to ovulation, the day of ovulation, and the day after, so about seven days total. All the ladies in the room right now are laughing inside, right? Because here's your pastor, your guy pastor, telling you about your menstrual cycle, okay? I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because guys in the room are stupid. Men, can I get an amen? Okay, all right. <laughs> Why do I tell you that? Why am I walking through that? Was that uncomfortable for me? Yes. Why do I say that? Isn't it interesting that if sex only function was just simply for reproduction, why did God create approximately 250 days a year where a woman's infertile? You know why that is? Because I think God intended sex not just for reproduction. He also intended it for pleasure. Look at what the first thing that Adam says when he saw Eve. God created Adam. He created Eve out of Adam. We know that. The first time Adam saw Eve, the first recorded words by any man in human history, this is what they said. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. You know what the Hebrew word in there is? Hubba hubba. I made that up. That's not true. That's what he said. He looked at his wife and he said, dang, thank you, God. You know why I know that? Verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Okay? This is a gift from God that God gave for pleasure. And I mean this in all seriousness. One of the most beautiful things in all of creation is a woman's body. Did you know that? There's something very psychological about that. It's through art. It's through history. It's even in God's word. That out of all creation that God created, and then God made woman special. And you know why I think that's important to talk about? Because I hear almost every woman that I know has talked about how they don't like their body in some way or some form, shape or form. Ladies, can I just say something to you? That's a lie from the pit of hell. The most beautiful thing God created is the female body. And that's why us guys have a hard time <laughs> struggling with that, because that is. But that's true. God created sex for pleasure. Sex is a tremendous gift from God. It's not simply meant just for reproduction, but also for pleasure. Look at what uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. And then he gets kind of graphic. This is in the Bible, church. A loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. In all seriousness, that word intoxicated is one of the strongest words in Hebrew language. It literally means to be completely drunk and obsessed with love for the beauty and the pleasure of your wife. Guys, can I get an amen? <laughs> you better say amen. You're going to be in trouble if you don't. <laughs> okay? That's what God says to do. There's an entire book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon. Sometimes it's called the Song of Songs. The entire book in the Bible is dedicated to sex. Why? Because God gave this to us as a gift, not just for reproduction, but also for pleasure as well. So now you might be asking, okay, pastor, 
If sex is a gift and it's given to us for reproduction and pleasure, then what's the harm? Let's go make babies and have fun. And now with the advent of birth control, we can even decide when we get pregnant and when we don't get pregnant, right? So we can have the fun without the babies if we want to. Do we really still need to put limits on sex? Do we have to take such a narrow view of, of what sex can, what does that look like? Is that still something we need to do, pastor? Is that just kind of archaic and, and back in the old days? This is the modern times, right? And if you remember our conversation last week, and I'm going to go back to it because it's so important to understand, that's what the majority of not just the world says, not just our culture says. Church, that's the majority of what people who say they're followers of Jesus say. And again, the statistics from um, that I cited last night, 57%, 57% of people who claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ say unmarried sex in a committed relationship is okay. 57%. 36% of evangelical Protestants, okay, just to narrow that gap down even further, say casual sex between consenting adults not in a committed relationship is still okay. That's God's church saying that. It's not just our culture anymore. And I said it before. I think the problem when it comes to this topic is not the world. The problem is the church. See, if sex is simply just for reproduction and for pleasure, there is no harm. Go out and have fun. But here's what I want you to understand, church, and this is so important. There's a third function for sex that is so important that we can't miss it. See, sex is for reproduction. It is for pleasure, but sex is also meant for holiness. Sex is a gift from God. Sex was given so we can be holy. Look at what Genesis 2, 24 says. When they're talking about this intimate relationship, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Well, pastor, isn't that just the Old Testament? I mean, we don't even know if there was a literal Adam and Eve. You know what? I believe in a literal Adam and Eve. You know why? Because I follow Jesus, and Jesus believes in the literal Adam and Eve. Look at what Jesus said. If you don't believe that, Jesus, in Matthew 19, he also says it in Mark 10. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, the Creator made them, male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. That idea of two people becoming one flesh, we're going to come back to that, but I just want you to grab that moment for a second. That's not simply just reproduction. That's not simply for ple pleasure. That is a spiritual moment that's happening. And I mentioned this last week. It's good to again to review that. When the followers of Jesus came together, after Jesus died and rose again, there was a conversation saying, okay, what does this thing look like now? Now that the Messiah has come and fulfilled Scripture, do we still need the Old Testament? Do we just throw it away? Do we do our own thing? Is it something new? And there was the council in Jerusalem that we talked about in Acts 15. I encourage you to go back to listen to that. And they decided that sexual, this idea of what sex means was so important. It was one of the big three things. They said, listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're going to hold to what God's Word says about that. And we've been standing on that bedrock ever since church. And it's so important we understand that. Look at the, what the writer of Hebrews says in verse, chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So here's what I want you to say, church, is God's word my authority. I understand that these words can be difficult. I can understand that these words can be controversial. And I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to, to put anybody on a defense. But I just want to make that statement. This is what God's word says. I can't do it any other way. To which some might say, well, God just wants to kill our fun, doesn't he? God just is a big cosmic killjoy sitting in heaven with a lightning bolt waiting to strike me down if I go out of line. He just wants to control our lives. And church, here's what I want you to understand. And this is so important. <laughs> Sex is a gift from God. And my God gives good gifts. My God gives good gifts. But when we misuse even good gifts, people can get hurt. And one of the greatest hurts in life, as a pastor that I've been for several years now, one of the greatest hurts that people have come to me and shared in their life had to do with the area of sex. 
either that they had been sexually assaulted, sexually abused, they've been cheated on, they've been abandoned by their parents. It's one of the greatest hurts can come sexually. And that's why God gave us this gift. It is a good gift, but we need to use it properly. It's not simply just for reproduction and pleasure. Let me, let me just go a little bit deeper on this because I think it's so important we understand it. See, when it comes to sex for reproduction, I like to think about gun safety. Walk with me here for a second. As growing up as a child, I had access to firearms. My dad did a wonderful job of teaching me how to treat firearms and what you should do. The number one rule with gun safety is this. Never point a gun at something you don't intend to kill. You've heard that before, right? It's very important. doesn't matter if it's loaded. doesn't matter if it's unloaded. You never point your gun at something you don't intend to kill. I need all the guys to look right here. Don't have sex with something you don't intend to get pregnant. Don't talk to me about birth control. Don't talk to me about this. If you're going to have a committed relationship with somebody, if you're going to take it to this extreme that you're going to have sex with a girl, you better be okay to be committed to them. See, I, I get frustrated because I hear a lot of times I talk about, oh, we have an abortion problem in our country. We don't have an abortion problem in our country. We have a man problem in our country. We have men that want to have sex with women and then walk away from the responsibility and leave that decision up to her. I don't think that's okay with God. Do you? Sex is not simply for reproduction, church. God never intended that to happen. And, and unintended babies, can I just say this? Sometimes there's unplanned pregnancies. There's no unplanned children. That is a life that God created. And there's a purpose for that. And we need to understand that. And that's something that we need to realize. When it comes to sex for pleasure, let, let's just play this out here for a second. I, I want you to imagine for a minute that you're a father. Maybe you, if you're a father, you have a daughter, you can play along. But I just want you to imagine this for a second. I want to imagine that you get a phone call. Person you don't know, you answer the number. Hey, I'm so-and-so. You've never met me before. But I just want to let you know that um, I've met your daughter, and she looks pretty hot. And so I'm going to take her, and I'm going to have sex with her. And, 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 but I'm not going to have any commitment with her at all. I, I'm just, I just want to you know, fulfill my pleasures, have sex with her, and just leave her, and you never see me again. Are you okay with that? To which every guy in the room would be like, not only am I not okay with that, I'm going to trace this call. I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, but why do we do that? We do that, don't we? When we say we want to just have sex with somebody, you know what Jesus said? And, and we're talking about God's word here. If we could just go for a second. Remember, we talk about how God's word's my authority. And if there's parts of the Bible we'd like to cut out and change, this is one part I'd like to change. You know what Jesus said? If you look at a person and you have lust in your heart after them, it's as if you've already committed adultery with them. Man, if we could cookie cut verses out of the Bible, I'd love to do that, church, because I'm guilty of that, and most guys are too. But why would you do that? That's a, child, that's a daughter of the God of the universe, amen? Now, if that's too hard of a stretch for you guys, I want you to think about it in this context. I want you to think about, you get a call. We'll go the same route. You get a call from a random guy, pick up the phone. Hi. Well, you don't know me. You've never met me before. And I know you're single right now. But I want you to know that there's a girl that you're going to marry one day. She's beautiful. She's awesome. You haven't met her yet, but, but you're going to marry her one day, and you guys are going to be happy forever. Oh, great. That's awesome. That's great news, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go have sex with her tonight, okay? And, and like I said, it's not going to mean anything. It's not going to matter. Are you okay if I have sex with her tonight? To which you would say, of course not, right? It's the same idea, isn't it? If you're not willing to be committed to this person in a marriage relationship and covenant, why would you sleep with somebody else's wife? You like to say, well, she's not married yet. She might be someday. And I guarantee you, you wouldn't be okay with that. See, sex is not just for reproduction. Sex is not just for pleasure. God has given us the gift of sex to be, make us holy. And that's one thing. So just to kind of help us out with this, I got a little analogy that I want to do. And I'm wondering, Andy, would you mind going off there and flipping off those lights for me? Those back two lights. Thank you, sir. Just because this is a difficult thing. I'm going to walk you through something here that I think is going to be really helpful. I've made this statement that sex is a gift from God. Yeah, you can just turn both off. That's good. Sex is a gift from God. God gives us good gifts, and God wants us to have good gifts. from The other gift that God gave us that's good is the gift of fire. Just like sex, God has given us the gift of fire. Fire's done some great things, hasn't it? We can cook with it. It keeps us warm, right? It, 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 can, it can drive our cars. Uh, lots of good things that can come from fire. But fire is meant to be contained. Because when fire is not contained, it can do some damage, can't it? 
And, and I, I swear to you, I prepared this message before what happened at our Yankton Middle School, so we know exactly what fire can do. <laughs> if you're from Yankton, you saw there was a fire in our middle school, if you didn't know, and it did some pretty significant damage. It was a small fire. It was quickly contained, but we're talking thousands of dollars in damages that have been done by fire just like that. It's the same way with sex. God has given us a beautiful gift. It's a wonderful thing. And he's not trying to hurt us. He's not trying to kill our fun. He says, listen, this is a good gift, but if it's used in the wrong way, man, can it do some damage. It can hurt some people. It can create life. I'm going to go back to that phrase where God said, in the image of God. I want you to think about this for a second because this is so important that you understand this idea of how sex is not just reproduction pleasure. Sex is about holiness. Think about this. God created man and woman in his image. When man and women come together in intimacy, fully known, fully understood, they create another human being in their image. Do you know what that means? The intimacy of sex is very close to the intimacy of creation of God with our relationship with each other. Do you follow that? Isn't that a beautiful statement? I've even heard it said, and some scholars have said this, this isn't me saying this, that actually heaven, when, when, we, when we get to be with Jesus one day, is going to feel like one big orgasm. Okay? And I'm not trying to be gross. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying that's the idea. Can you imagine that? You know, I've always heard people joke and say, well, I'd rather be in hell partying with my friends. You go do that. I'm going to go have an internal orgasm, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, isn't that beautiful how God can give us something wonderful like that? But it's meant to be contained. It's meant to be controlled because when it's not, it can hurt. That's why one of the deepest hurts you can have in your life is sexual hurts. That's why one of the deepest pains you can have or regrets Maybe because it's sexual, because you didn't contain it the way God intended it to be. And again, church, this is what God's word says. This is the authority that I stand on. God wants us to be fully known, to be fully loved, and understood that. See, there's three functions that sex portrays. And the first one is for reproduction. It does create life. In the image of God, you were created. And out of that image of God, when it joins together, another life can be created. And again, I want to say it. There's such a thing as unplanned pregnancies. There's no such thing as an unwanted child. It's a beautiful thing. Sex is intended for pleasure. Church, we need to get over our prudish behavior. I'm just tired of it. We need to be, embrace it and say, yes, sex is pleasurable. It is fun. It is enjoyable. We're not going to lie about that or deny that. But there is a third purpose for sex, and it's for holiness. As you leave today... Um, you're going to get a little candle, <laughs> and it's going to be just like this. And the reason why we're going to do that is I want to represent for you what this means, and I don't want you to forget this. And, and I'm going to say this throughout this series. Romans 1.8 says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. If you're here today, if you're listening online, if you're listening to our podcast, I want you to understand no matter what your sexual history is, Jesus died on the cross for that. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to condemn you. What I'm here to say is God has given you a gift, and we need to make sure we're using it in the way that he intended it. And as you take that candle, I'm, I'm asked two things about that candle, and I'm not trying to be silly, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but what I'm saying is if you take that candle and you're married, I want you to use that candle, okay? And, and again, I'm not trying to be inappropriate. I'm not trying to be gross, but I want you to think about that is a beautiful creation that God has given you and a wonderful gift of holiness. And I shared before how Elaine and I, even in our own life, in our relationship before we were married, in our relationship with other people, we were not sexually pure. So I'm not standing up here judging anybody. But I need you to understand something. Marriage doesn't solve the sin problem. Just because you get married, it doesn't make it, now it's okay what we did before. There needs to be a confession there that needs to happen. We need to lay it before the feet of Jesus, and then we need to leave it there. And we need to move forward in a relationship of beautiful unity and harmony. But if you're here today, you watched online, you listen to podcasts, we'll get you a candle, just email us, whatever. I want you to have that candle. And if you're not married, I want you to keep that candle. I don't care what your past is. Today is a new day. God can redeem it. I want you to save that candle. And someday, when you put it in the context of the way God has, on that wedding night, male or female, you can come to them and you can say, listen, this is a gift that I want to give you for my God. 
Because God can do that. God can redeem whatever situation you're a part of. And that candle is going to represent it. Let's pray. God, I'm not trying to be funny, but I thank you for the gift of sex. I thank you that in all the ways that you could have possibly thought to create another human being, you said, I got a really good idea. (laughs) And you made it that way. And you said it's not just for reproduction, God. You also blessed it for pleasure. God, you've made it beautiful. You've made it passionate. You've made it emotional, God, and and, and the intimacy that comes from that is so cool. But God, I stand here before you today knowing that I have misused sex in my life. And I don't know where this lands for anyone else, God, but I just pray that if there's unconfessed moments of that, God, that we would bring that before you right now. We could be free from that past, God. Maybe there's a sexual hurt. Maybe there's a sexual abuse, a sexual assault, wherever that lands, that, that God, we can bring that to you and find healing in that. And God, moving forward from this day forward, we can use this wonderful gift in the way that you intended it. Not to kill our fun, but to bless our lives and to be a blessing for other people so we can understand what it means to truly be holy and intimate with another person and with you. God, we thank you and praise you and ask all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.